six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. is on the moon, yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful, man. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of... Uh, United States, it's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Welcome back to Miss Kelly's Book Nook for episode two in our space exploration series. So last time we learned about the planet Earth, but today we're going to be leaving Earth and going to the only other place in the solar system that a person has actually walked on, besides Earth, of course. Do you know what that place is? If you said the moon, then you're right. So last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, which is when the first men ever walked on the surface of the moon. But Apollo missions continued even after that one, and they continued until December of 1972. So really, we're still in the middle of celebrating the 50th anniversaries of the Apollo missions. So that's why I chose this book for us today. So this book is called Go for the Moon, A Rocket, A Boy, and the First Moon Landing. A Rocket, A Boy, and the First Moon Landing. So why would the word boy be included in the title if it's about going to the moon? What do you think the importance of the boy is? Hmm. Let's find out. Go for the moon. A rocket, a boy, and the first moon landing. Written and illustrated by Chris Gall. The moon is out tonight. In the morning, three brave men will climb into a giant rocket and blast off into space and fly to the moon. And for the first time ever, people will try to walk on it. I'm so excited that I can't sleep. The astronauts are ready for the mission, and so am I. Thrusts 
lift the rocket off the ground and away from Earth's gravity. The heavier the rocket, the more thrust is needed. The main, rock, main engine on the moon rocket provides 1.5 million pounds of thrust. That means the engine is able to lift 1.5 million pounds into the air. But the rocket to the moon weighs 6.2 million pounds, as much as 400 elephants. So it will need five engines to get it off the ground. So you see these? These are the engines. One, two, three, four, five. The giant rocket that will take the astronauts to the moon is called the Saturn V. It is 363 feet tall. And if you can see, here's a comparison. Here's the Statue of Liberty, and here's the Saturn V rocket. Woo! That's pretty big. After I built my rocket, I practiced jumping to see how far away from the ground I could go. I am using thrust to jump into the air, but Earth's gravity pulls me down. So how much thrust is in your jump? The Saturn V rocket has three sections, or stages, stacked together. Each has its own set of engines and functions as a separate rocket. When a stage runs out of propellant, it will be left behind, making the Saturn V lighter. A lighter rocket needs less propellant and can fly farther with its payload, which is the astronauts, their spacecraft, and their moon lander. When the first stage runs out of propellant, it is left behind to fall into the ocean. The same thing happens to the second stage. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the stages are stacked together in a huge building with the help of a giant crane. The crane can lift 500,000 pounds or the weight of 30 large bulldozers. The person who operates the crane has to be very careful. In order to qualify for the job, they have to prove they can lower the, a, a practice section into an egg without cracking it. And we have the different stages here. The third stage takes the payload into space. Do you remember what the payload is? That's right, it is the astronauts, their spacecraft, and their moon landing, and pushes it to the moon. So that huge rocket is just to get this little bit into space. I transported my rocket to the launch pad. My rocket is little, but I still have to be careful. Months before, after it was assembled, the Saturn V was moved to the launch pad. A giant machine called the Crawler was driven under the rocket and the launch tower. It moved very slowly. It took about six hours to move the rocket three miles to the pad. The Saturn V engines create thrust by burning the propellant. The hot gases shooting from the giant nozzles will lift the rocket into the air. So you see, this is a tank with a gas called kerosene. This has oxygen, and then these are the engines. So this is the propellant that is burning through the engine to shoot them off into space. The engines do not burn gasoline like a car, but a mixture of kerosene and oxygen in the first stage. 
The upper two stages burn oxygen and hydrogen, a very light, very explosive gas. My rocket uses water as a propellant. I filled the tank, then I pumped the rocket full of air. When the air is squeezed, it is called compression. The compressed air will force the water out to provide thrust, and then the rocket will lift into the air. So you can see here's his rocket. So it's filled with water here, and there's air here. And when the air gets under so much pressure, it's gonna push the water out through the bottom. And that's what's going to shoot his rocket into the air. On the morning of the launch, I have a good breakfast of eggs and bacon and my favorite orange drink called Tang. It is getting close to countdown. I need to get my little astronauts on board. The Saturn V astronauts have their own breakfast early in the morning. Then they are sent to a special room to get into their space suits. They need help. The special suitcases they carry will give them oxygen to breathe until their capsule is safely in space. So you see those, those things that they're carrying? You see the tubes that come out from them and go into the spacesuit? That's how the astronauts can breathe. So the oxygen is in the little suitcase and it flows through the tube and into the spacesuit and that's how they're able to breathe until they get into outer space. Three hours before liftoff, they ride to the launch tower and take the elevator to the top of the Saturn V. It is high above the ground It is time for the launch. I check the area for safety. No branches or wires overhead, check. No birds in the sky, check. My brother tells me the launch pad is ready. The people who help the astronauts along the way to and from the moon are in a building called Mission Control in Houston, Texas. They can talk to the astronauts and check all the systems of the spacecraft from far away using radio signals. This is called telemetry. Because Earth is always turning and the rocket will be moving, they have to put antennas all over the world, even on ships and planes. My brother confirms we are go for launch. We are go for the moon. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, lift off. To get to the moon, the Saturn V must be steered in the right direction. But the moon is moving around Earth so it does not stay in one place. It's like if my brother kicks a soccer ball and I throw a stone to try and hit the ball while it is flying through the air. This is how hard it is to land on the moon without flying right past it. When the astronauts are safely circling or orbiting Earth, they check all their equipment to make sure everything is working properly. The direction and speed of the spacecraft are measured from the ground. This is called navigation and guidance. To check the results from mission control, the astronauts use a special instrument called a sextant to find their position, just as sailors did long ago to guide their way across the oceans. So this is what a sextant looks like. So this was a very early sailor's sextant, sextant that was used to help people find their way when they were sailing at sea. After they have orbited Earth nearly twice, the third stage is reignited to push the astronauts away from Earth's gravity and toward the moon. In three days, the moon's gravity will be stronger. 
I climb through the hatch of my spaceship. Until I get to the moon, this will be my home. I bring food and water and power for the trip. I even pack a jar of Tang. The vehicle that will take the astronauts and the moon lander all the way to the moon is made of two parts. One, the service module, that's what this part is, with a large engine and one command module that the astronauts will live and return to Earth in. The astronauts name the vehicle Columbia. So you can see here, electricity comes from fuel cells in the service module. They combine hydrogen and oxygen, which creates electricity. The electricity charges the batteries on board. The fuel cells also create lots of water, both for the astronauts to drink and to cool the spacecraft. So from this little section here, you see a fuel cell. And that's how they generate electricity while they're in outer space on the Apollo missions. The command and service modules are like a very small house. They carry everything the astronauts will need on their journey. Food, air, water, and power. They also shield them from the cold of space. So you can see the astronauts inside the command module. The command module is not designed to land on the moon. A separate landing vehicle called the lunar module is safely tucked into the top of the third stage rocket. The astronauts have nicknamed it Eagle. The astronauts ignite explosives to cut Columbia free from the third stage. They turn the Columbia around by using several mini rockets on the outside of the ship. So you can see the lunar module is inside that rocket. And so they've turned the command module around so that it's pointing at the lunar module. And at the tip of the command module is this little probe, the docking probe. And it has these latches here and it goes into the top of the lunar module. That's how they connect them. Now the astronauts can go from one ship to the other. Today, together, they coast all the way to the moon. So all of those rockets, and this is all that's left that's going to go to the moon. And this part and this part aren't even coming home with them. I eat my snacks from a plastic bag and I sip my tang through a straw. I make sure I don't spill anything because in space there is no gravity. Any spills will float around inside the ship and cause trouble for the spacecraft and the astronauts. The astronauts sleep when they can, but it is not easy because there are many noises inside the spacecraft. They eat food that's just like food on Earth, but it's dried out so it'll weigh less. Water is added from a special water gun when it's time to eat it. The next day, I get to know my lunar module. I have to climb a ladder to get in and out of it. It has no seats, so we have to stand to see out the windows. Eagle has two parts. The lower part has its own engine, which is used to slow down Eagle as it approaches the surface of the moon. The legs are extended before departing from the command service module and have large round pads in case the ground is very soft. The upper part also has an engine and room for two astronauts. It will carry them to the moon's surface and back to command module after landing. So you can see, here's our lunar module. And these are the legs and the feet, and that's what's going to land on the moon. And it's got its own little, en well, not little, but it's got its own engine here. And that's what's going to help it slowly 
go down onto the surface of the moon and we have space up here for the astronauts. It is time to put on my spacesuit. The astronauts' suits are like small spaceships. The moon has no air, so they have a special backpack that gives them oxygen to breathe and water for cooling. The suit is made of many layers. The first layer has hundreds of feet of tubing that carries water to cool the body. The next layer keeps the air inside and the outer layer provides protection from heat and cold. Also, the suits are easy to move in. So you can see he's got a visor, got an antenna here for communication. So now, remember when they carried those little suitcases on the ground? Well, now they have like a backpack and that's where they have their oxygen supply. And the same kind of thing, they have a, a hose, a tube that takes the oxygen into their spacesuit so they can breathe. And you can see they're showing you what it looks, what the inner side looks like. And then these are his boots. After Columbia has orbited the moon several times, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin say goodbye to Michael Collins. He will stay behind in Columbia and wait for them to return. Neil and Buzz climb aboard Eagle, close the hatch and undock from Columbia. So undock meaning that they come apart. So now we've got Michael Collins over here who's flying the command module and we've got Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin inside the lunar module and they're not connected anymore. Landing on the moon isn't easy. The astronauts aim to land at a place called the Sea of Tranquility. It isn't a real sea because there's no water on the moon. To get there, they have to steer Eagle exactly with just the right amount of thrust to slow down Eagle so they don't crash. The astronauts fire their engine to slowly drop closer to the moon's surface. I send my lunar module down a piece of string. If the lunar module goes down too fast, it will crash. If it goes down too so slowly, it will run out of fuel and also crash. The string needs to be at just the right angle. A small computer controls Eagle. When they get closer to the moon's surface, Neil guides the computer to a safe landing spot. Carefully, he inches toward the surface of the moon. He does not want to land in a crater. Then, with a soft bump, Eagle lands on the moon. My whole family huddles around the TV. Everyone is so nervous that no one speaks. Finally, I see a shadow moving across the screen. On the TV, I hear, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong is the first man to walk on the moon. Buzz Aldrin climbs down the ladder next. I run around the house practicing my giant leaps. With the moon shining brightly overhead, I bound outside like a real astronaut. The astronauts have two and a half hours on the surface of the moon. They collect rocks, take pictures, and set up experiments. The moon has much less gravity than Earth, so an astronaut needs less effort to hop around. They jump like little kids but soon it's time to go home. They leave their backpacks on the moon because they will not need them again. And they no longer need the landing section of the lunar module, so it is also left behind. But they also left something else. What is this? Neil and Buzz ignite Eagle's engine and blast off the moon. Soon they carefully dock 
to Columbia. They bring some rocks and their pictures with them. Then they detach eagle and aim for the earth the same way that they aimed for the moon. They use the thrust from Columbia's main engine to push them out of orbit and away from the moon's gravity. Soon, Earth's gravity will become stronger, and after three days, their journey will be almost over. Then they will be near home. The empty eagle slowly falls back to the moon, where it eventually creates a crater. So now they've gotten off the surface of the moon. This part of the lunar module stayed behind. This got them back to the command module. And then once they were in the command module, bye-bye eagle, got left at the moon. When Columbia nears Earth, it is time to say goodbye to the service module. The two parts of the spacecraft separate with a bang. So you can see there's the service module and there's the command module. And now they're separate. This is all that's gonna come home. The astronauts use little rockets to turn Columbia around so its large round heat shield is pointed toward the Earth. When an object passes through air at a high speed, the air is compressed in front of it and it gets very hot. When Columbia reaches Earth's atmosphere, this shock wave will become almost as hot as the surface of the sun. The heat shield prevents it from burning up. The vehicle must enter the atmosphere at just the right angle or it will skip away into space. So you can see here's the angle that it needs to come in. If it doesn't come in at that right angle, it's going to get bounced off the Earth's atmosphere and fly off into space. If it comes too low, it's going to burn up in the heat. When Columbia reaches 10,000 feet above the ocean, it is slowed enough and the main parachutes shoot out of its nose. Soon it lands safely in the sea with a terrific splash. Big balloons keep Columbia upright. So that's how they had to get back to Earth to splash down in the sea. The astronauts are home safe. They have traveled 500,000 miles to do what no human has ever done before. Thousands of men and women on Earth helped them get to the moon. Soon there will be parades and hugs and tears of joy. On this day, I have more thrust than I've ever had before. Back in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center, a new rocket is being prepared and new astronauts are training. The next countdown starts. At home, the countdown has started too. My next journey has just begun. So that concludes our story for today. So let's pause for some fun facts. All right, so it's time for some fun facts all about the moon. Now, if you remember, I asked you at the beginning why the title included the word a boy. Well, let's hear what the author has to say. On July 20th, 1969, at nine in the evening, I sat transfixed in front of a snowy black and white television in a small farmhouse in rural Illinois. The dark shapes on the screen were hard to make out and the wait had been long. Neil Armstrong was about to descend the ladder of the lunar module and set foot on the moon. In that moment, my life's path would be forever changed. I was seven years old. Astronomy and space travel were my first true passions. 
I built all the models from the Apollo program. I spent every clear night in my front yard peering through an antique telescope and hoping to see something that no one had ever seen before. I launched small rockets propelled by compressed water. By the time I was 12, I had built my first rocket that actually burned solid rocket fuel. In subsequent years, I built many more, all with different flight characteristics, allowing me to go even higher and faster. My interest in rocketry continues to this day. While I was never able to actually propel myself into space, I was eventually able to find a way to get off the ground. I earned my pilot's license as soon as I had the money to do so, and I eventually embarked on the pursuit of the crowning achievement of any aspiring model maker. I built my own aircraft. Not a model, but a real plane that I could fly. I still have my rockets, though some are now old and fragile and will never fly again. Many flew to great heights. Some smashed to pieces when the parachutes failed, and a few left Earth with a shattering roar, soaring higher and higher until they were way out of sight, never to be seen again. I like to think that one of them made it to the moon. And that's from the author. So the boy in this book was the author. So here are some fun facts. The first liquid-fueled rocket was invented by Robert Goddard in 1926. Surfboard makers were employed to help design the insulation between the fuel tanks because they had better knowledge of lightweight foam cells. Early test models of the command module were dropped from towers into pools of water to test the strength of the capsule design. The first model promptly sank. Hamburger buns were banned on board because the crumbs could get into delicate instruments. As the command module flew to the moon, the sun would heat the sunny side of the ship to dangerously hot levels. The spaceship had to rotate slowly to equally distribute the heat on all sides. It was called barbecue mode. So just like you would roast a chicken or a pig or something in a barbecue, it had to rotate to make sure that it didn't burn up from the heat of the sun. The walls of the lunar module were slightly thicker than aluminum foil. The lander had to be as light as possible and the spacecraft did not have to hold much air pressure. Astronauts had to take great care not to puncture the walls. Can you imagine? You got angry and punched the wall of the lunar module? Hmm. The Apollo 11 mission utilized 400,000 engineers, technicians, and scientists. Most of the lunar module was covered in mylar to reflect the sun's hot rays. It had to be lightweight. Mylar is the same material used in party balloons. Early suit designs inflated like a balloon when pressurized with air. The astronauts could not move in them. Without spacesuits in the vacuum of space, moisture on and inside the astronauts' bodies would boil. The oxygen in their cells would fatally expand, also causing their blood to boil. The company that made spacesuits for the astronauts had only made women's underwear before the space program. 500 million viewers around the world tuned in to watch the first steps on the moon. You ready for this one? An iPhone has more computing power than all the computers NASA used during the Apollo program. Every computer used 50 years ago for the Apollo programs was less powerful than a simple iPhone. Wow. And it got to the moon and back numerous times. Well, that concludes our fun facts. 
So now, let's chat. All right, let's chat. So our story today, Go for the Moon, was not just about the moon landing in 1969, but also about a young boy as he experienced watching the moon landing happen live and how that impacted him. And what did he do? He was building lots of rockets and he grew up to build more model rockets and eventually his own plane. So I would imagine that that little seven-year-old boy had big dreams. Maybe he dreamed of becoming an astronaut. He didn't become an astronaut, but he still achieved something that he really, really loved. So sometimes we have dreams and hopes and they're as big as we can imagine. And sometimes we keep those all our lives and sometimes as we grow older, we change them a little, but those passions are still what's so important to us. So have a discussion with your kids about what excites them. What are their dreams? What are their passions? How can they pursue them now and in the future? And what are some options of ways they can use those passions? Because sometimes we don't always follow life in one straight path. Sometimes we take turns and go this way and that way. But if we follow our hearts, we'll end up where we're supposed to be. So have a discussion with your kids all about their dreams and their passions. All right, today's activity is gonna be super fun. Found it on the NASA website, as always, link down below. You can download specific instructions on how to do this activity. You can also see a video of a mother and a son doing this activity together. And it's all about impact craters. Craters are those little dents, those little divots on the surface of the moon. And since there's no wind on the moon, those craters just stay there. They don't fill in again. So by exploring craters, scientists can learn more about what the earth is made of because you can see the layers. So you want a pan like this. Now um, I chose to use, mine came with a lid, so I chose to use the lid so that you could see it on the side, but you could use the foil pan if you wanted to. I'm gonna get this out of the way here. So what I did was I took this lid and at the bottom I filled it with flour and then there's a layer of cornmeal and then there's a layer of cornstarch. And if you see on the top, I sprinkled it with hot cocoa mix, some coffee crystals and a little bit of cracked pepper. So you can use different materials such as that certainly want to use different textures and different colors of materials. And you're going to need some rocks or some marbles. These are going to be your projectiles that are going to create your craters. So this is the surface of the moon. So this is how we can learn from craters. So if you just look at the top like this, can you see the flower all the way down at the bottom? Of course not. So we don't know what is on the lower layers unless something hits it and we can see those bottom layers. So I'm going to be very careful on how I do this, but you can have a whole, whole lot more fun. Make sure you spread out a nice tarp or maybe do this outside so that you can make a big old mess. But I'm going to be a little more careful just to demonstrate for you. So you take your projectiles and you <laughs> drop them or throw them onto the surface of your moon. You can throw them at different angles. And even when you're not trying to make a mess, you can still make a big old mess. But then take your projectiles 
out and you can explore your craters. You can see different parts of them. And in this handy dandy guide to this activity, the last page actually helps you identify the different parts of a crater. And that's what you can do on your own surface of the moon. And so I hope you learn something about craters through this activity and something about the moon as well. But most important, I hope you have a lot of fun with this. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And remember, videos are good. One-on-one -on -one is better. Read with your kids. See you next time. Bye.